Well, let's begin. Uh, I want to welcome you all. I'm Orville Shell, Dean here at the Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, this event uh, arose around the advent of uh, Michael Nauman, who's going to be in town, uh, co-editor of Die Zeit, co-publisher. Uh, before that, he was uh, a federal minister of culture in Germany, and before that had a long and distinguished career in publishing. Uh, at Rovalt and indeed was one of the animating forces behind setting up a uh, uh, new publishing company under Holt in New York, uh, Metropolitan, for which I have the pleasure of being an author. Uh, but we thought since Michael was going to be here and uh, was in an interesting position to reflect on the ways in which uh, Germany has come to view the United States, that we'd expand it out a little and after he delivers some remarks, um, have a group of people who are here at the journalism school, both teaching and as visiting scholars, give brief summaries of how things look from their countries and how uh, our own country here, the United States, is viewed from different places around the world. So let me quickly just tell you who all is going to be here. At the end is Francis Pisani, who is French and writes for Le Monde, El País, and La Reforma in, in Mexico, and is teaching here. Lily Sedeghi, uh, right to my right, uh, is Iranian, and has worked for many years uh, in Iran uh, uh, with broadcasters from Europe and America who've come to cover that country, and has followed the media very closely there. She's a visiting scholar here at the Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, Roberto Guareschi, uh, has been the editor of Clarín, Argentina's largest paper, and is here this year teaching and has just led a group of students to Argentina on a reporting trip. Muzamil Jalil uh, is the bureau chief in Kashmir for the Indian Express, and he too is here as a visiting scholar and will be returning to Kashmir with some of our students after graduation. Mariko Horikawa, uh, is a correspondent at Yomiyori Shimbun in Japan and is part of an exchange program we have with that newspaper and is teaching here uh, this spring on covering uh, Japan. So without further ado, let me welcome you, Michael, to talk for 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to be quite draconian about limiting you all because I want to get the audience involved and also get some discussion going amongst panel members as well. So, uh, Michael, the podium is yours. Thank you, Orville. Um, it's a pretty tall order to uh, describe the German media's attitude or uh, way of reporting on the United States because obviously we have, I think, altogether about a thousand newspapers uh, in Germany, um, most of them uh, outlets of larger papers, so altogether basically 300 independent newspapers and just like you, a vast, uh, superfluous uh, uh, array of um, TV channels. Um, but in the end, um, reporting on the United States um, is defined by two things in Germany. First of all, by um, the outcome of the Second World War. Uh, without uh, the United States and England and indeed France, um, as occupational uh, forces in Germany, we would not have what we now definitely call a free press. Uh, God knows what would have happened. I'm, th I'm glad I don't have to think about that. Um, secondly, um, reporting on the United States today is defined by two, I think, important facts. All the correspondence in the United States, the Zeit has altogether two, um, is defined by the fact that they do speak the language. Uh, you may find this a silly remark, but I've seen too many correspondents from the New York Times pass through Germany, 80 million people, major ally of the United States who didn't speak the language. And how they uh, worked uh, is beyond me. Some of them became extremely famous as journalists, which only shows you ours is a wonderful profession. <laughs> and you can wing it in any language if you want to. Um, but not only that. Um, I think the majority of the correspondence 
who work in the United States, or at least a lot of them of my age group, went to high school in the United States. Recipients of the American Field Service uh, scholarships, the Youth for Understanding, all sorts of church organizations, which put uh, um, 16, 17 year old kids into American high schools where they either lettered in track or uh, did other nice things, but enjoyed co-educational schooling, which uh, 30 years ago was unheard of in Germany. In other words, like me, um, I was politicized um, by institutions, for instance, like the America Houses, which have all been closed down under the uh, of recent uh, administrations, uh, literally destroying, I think, uh, a, an important aspect of the American image abroad, which is a cultural aspect, which is, should not only be defined by what comes out of Hollywood, but by the American music and literature. These were very, very important uh, places where you could uh, learn about America and um, define your view of uh, what is now called the hyperpower. And finally, um, talking about people who write about this country, those who are here or were here or went to high school or university or were trained here, wrote their dissertations, whether it's at Harvard or Berkeley, I know a number of those, uh, they all brought back something which uh, I think enhanced the overall journalism, German journalism, and that is um, they understood uh, Freedom of speech actually means independence, uh, uh, to be independent from the government and to criticize it as harshly as, as you can. Um, which, in the case of reporting on the United States, has produced some rather interesting effects. Those people who feel uh, psychologically connected to the United States do feel they can criticize the United States just like their American colleagues. This, however, runs into a difficult problem because conservative Germany, and Germany is by and large a fairly conservative country, would regard this kind of critical reporting on the United States as anti-Americanism. So whenever that happens, I uh, challenge those people who, for instance, accuse me when I write critically about this administration Please define Americanism, which immediately silences them. Because then I point out the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and the great tradition of free speech, which played an important role for my generation, emanating from this place right here. So in short, um, the uh, reporting on the United States is by and large, I think, defined by a fairly good knowledge not only of the language, but also of the intricacies of American politics in Washington and elsewhere. Um, to get to the last couple of years, which were obviously one of the most important and interesting aspects of reporting as a German or as a German journalist about the United States, <clears throat> what kind of information do we rely on? As it turns out, mostly American information, of course. Um, and that indeed is something which differentiates, differentiates the United States and the public sphere of the United States entirely from the still fairly arcane, arcane world of European politics. The United States does not have secrets, period. I've just finished uh, the book by, uh, um, reading the book by uh, Woodward, um, uh, The uh, Plan to Attack, and is that the correct title? I think so plan of attack. Um, and boy, there is not a single secret. Not a single secret. I'm sure a lot of things have been left out. But this kind of reporting uh, is extremely influential on the formation of European, uh, and not only our local American correspondents, our European attitudes toward the United States politics. We are, as journalists, extremely well informed if I compare American reporting, for instance, on Germany. Uh, we simply know more because there's more out, uh, out on the streets, out uh, uh, in the papers, in the magazines, less so in TV. 
but basically uh, the websites. There's one particular one which I find absolutely amazing called truthout.org, which does nothing else, but uh, obviously is not a fan of uh, this particular administration, collects all the critical articles of, uh, on this administration, and you can click into it every day, and uh, it's by now probably as fat as uh, the collected works of Proust, and you can read a lot. Uh, about what is going on in the administration, and that indeed flows into the reporting. Um, is the reporting biased, just as in any other uh, nation or country, including this country? Every journalist, uh, uh, much more, actually a little bit more uh, uh, in, in Germany than elsewhere, every journalist is opinionated. That's why he went into the business, to enlighten people, but he brings along attitudes. They change. As you get older, uh, you're not a radical anymore, but you still think your job is to enlighten the world uh, um, in order to make it more rational and sensible. And um, uh, unlike, again, in, as uh, for instance, the New York Times, uh, Die Zeit, my paper, uh, specializes in opinionated articles. You are, when you buy it, uh, you know you're going to get opinions, but they have to be based on as many facts as possible. So um, the attitude of uh, overall the German press towards this administration is definitely defined by uh, the um, unilateralism of the United States, not only since 9-11, but prior to that, which was keenly observed and uh, commented, uh, commented by the majority of the uh, German newspapers, um, uh, not uh, with great favor, obviously, because the United States had succeeded in building a um, international framework of treaties, uh, alliances, and uh, sometimes even friendship between politicians, which have uh, basically gone by the wayside since the Bush administration took over. I don't have to uh, mention the Kyoto, uh, the traditional uh, um, uh, treaty that actually was never ratified uh, in Europe with the exception of Romania. The uh, departure from the Kyoto tr uh, treatment of uh, the uh, uh, ABM, the Biological Warfare uh, Protocol, all that stuff which was basically nixed by this administration was um, watched. That was watched that as it was happening. The real break, so to speak, I think the largest rift between uh, Europe, with the exception, of course, of uh, the Spanish, the British, and the Polish government, and the Bulgarian, and the, I think even the Romanian government, um, the biggest rift, obviously, was the decision to go to war against Iraq. Uh, the, uh, with the exception of one large newspaper group, the Springer Press in Germany, even the most conservative papers thought that this was a mistake. Uh, not out of cynical reasons, but simply because we all, uh, those journalists who've been in the region, including me, uh, thought that uh, the setup of the Middle East is such that the notion that to march in with an army, a Christian army at that, um, and um, with all best intentions, teach these folks democracy is, uh, to put it mildly, naive. Uh, and that is uh, not born out of um, a feeling of superiority, but rather of, uh, by a knowledge of history, a certain knowledge of history. And uh, the, the notion or the idea, as, as uh, voiced by people like Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl and others, that there would be a domino theory of, I call it a domino theory of good hope, that uh, the stones would all uh, fall in the right direction in the end, within two or three years, we would have democracy there, obviously was an extremely illusionary hope. And the constant comparison to it worked in Japan and in Germany, uh, for instance, by uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice, were naive. Why? In Germany, it was to totally forgotten between 45 and 49, 1945 and 49, over a thousand Germans were hung, or is it hanged, uh, executed by the Allies for war crimes. Nothing of the sort is happening uh, in Iraq, not that I suggest it, 
but uh, that gives you one indication. The other indication is that Germany actually did have a democratic tradition. Uh, it didn't work too well during the Weimar Republic, but actually that tradition went back to the 1848. And it was a tradition that was suppressed, but it was there. And the leaders of the post-war German uh, um, governments, local governments, city governments, many of them, unfortunately not all of them, but many of them actually came out of the camps, concentration camps, or were imprisoned or came from exile, like uh, Willy Brandt. So there was a core, a fairly large core of uh, administrative and uh, political class that indeed uh, wanted democracy. And so in the end did the whole population because the country was completely destroyed. 360 cities in Germany had been destroyed to the degree of up to 90%. So that taught everybody a big lesson. And the moral uh, uh, state after the Holocaust, uh, after it became known to practically everybody, in fact, people were forced to go to the movies and watch these films done by, by, by uh, nobody else but Hitchcock, for instance, who did the documentary on Bergen-Belsen. The, uh, the result of that uh, traumatized the whole nation. And there was not a notion, not a thought of uh, attacking the, uh, the, the victors of the war, but in fact collaboration was the rule. Nothing of the sort is happening in Iraq, um, and um, therefore the comparison didn't work. It, I can't speak about Japan. There's a colleague from Japan who, who uh, might point out some of the, the, the fallacies of that comparison, which uh, had been brought forth by a number of, of um, Washington politicians. What, however, uh, scared us most, and it literally did scare us, is something which uh, I think has never been reported, or if it was reported, I didn't see it in this paper, was that after 9-11, there was, in Washington, according to my quote-unquote sources, talk in the panic of post-9-11, to use tactical nuclear weapons in Kabul and Baghdad. And so when Schroeder gave his speech, putting his political life on the line, saying, okay, we will participate in enduring freedom. We will send troops. Germany actually had sent troops before to Kosovo, post-war, but for the first time on a real large scale into Afghanistan. He gave a speech saying that we, our solidarity with the United States is basically unlimited with one exception, adventures. So I talked to him and said, as a journalist, I knew him well from my political job, I called him up and he said, what do you mean with adventures? And then he said, there were hair-raising plans and reactions to what had happened in New York and in Washington. And so uh, it wasn't totally unknown that there was a plan to attack Iraq. And that is uh, basically when that big rift between Bush and, uh, um, and Schroeder happened. And in fact, um, while Woodward is now making a big case that the United States was, that actually only in November did Bush make up his mind in 2002. In November 2002, he made up his mind to go to war against Iraq, that's wrong. They were, they were decide, he was decided much earlier, he decided much earlier to do this. There was a famous one conversation between Schroeder uh, and Bush who was on his way to Warsaw and stopped over in Berlin and Schroeder was in the middle of an election campaign which he was about to lose. And uh, Bush told him we will not do anything what could it have been before the September election in Germany? And two months later, Cheney gave this speech on August 27th to the uh, veterans of foreign wars and clearly stated, we will go to war, which gave the, uh, the key, basically, to, for Schroeder to win the election by simply saying, we will, under no circumstances, will we participate in such a war. And then he made a big mistake. He said, even if the United, the United Nations supports it. Uh, 
I think that was a political mistake because he basically showed the same attitude towards the United Nations as did Cheney. Uh, in short, uh, that is when the uh, rift between Germany and the United States became uh, very profound and uh, I think has reached a level um, which will make it very hard for Germany to come back into uh, any kind of a plan that would pacify and solve the almost tragic situation in Iraq in the near future. The German press reported on this according, of course, uh, to its political point of views. The conservative press attacked Schroeder for it, but in the end, the, he won the election. The rift is there, and uh, uh, communication hasn't broken down totally, obviously. The diplomats are working hard and are talking to each other, but actually, Bush and Schroeder have talked, I think, once since this happened. This is now two years ago. Uh, which is a very unusual uh, state of affair considering not the size of Germany, but rather the fact that the economic ties between the United States and Germany are larger than they ever have been, and there's more investment, American investment, growing every year. And Europe and the United States do share 70% of world trade. One should think communication should improve between the leaders of these two nations, and it might. Well, okay, I think I've reached the end of my 20 minutes. All I'm trying to say is the role of journalists in all of this uh, should be, from my point of view, reporting as precisely as you can on what is happening and not falling, just one more dig at my friends, the electronic boys, into the trap of embedded journalism. Uh, we've had, the Zeit has had uh, three correspondents in the war. One was a stringer uh, who was in Baghdad. One was a very adventurous investigative journalist who had actually been working with the Mujahedin as a truck driver and had excellent connections uh, to um, northern Iraq. So he was there, uh, talked to Sarkavi, uh, not Sarkavi, that group which was producing or trying to produce uh, chemical weapons. So we had a small scoop there. And the other journalist, who is actually our expert on Iraq, never got into the war. He just wasn't let in and was not, quote, unquote, embedded because he happened to be a German journalist. Although, in fact, he's an Italian. But that didn't help. He was working for a German paper, so he wasn't, quote, unquote, embedded, uh, um, which did not uh, prevent us, I think, from reporting fairly on what was going on and what is going on now. Thank you. I think there are a few more seats here. Uh, if, if you all want to filter in, feel free. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, let's go down the list as it's in the, in the order of the program. So Roberto Guareschi, uh, former editor of Clarín in uh, Argentina, you're next for five minutes. You're right. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'll try to talk, uh, I'll try to explain in, in five minutes what is the, uh, the image of uh, the United States and Argentina. And not from the point of view of the journalism, but from the point of view of the people. Uh, only 34% of the Argentines regard favorably uh, the United States and Argentina. Not a single country in Latin America has a lower, a lower image of the United States. Uh, these figures uh, belong to 2002, so they might be even uh, smaller nowadays after the cruel uh, events in Iraq and, the, uh, and in Spain. <clears throat> uh, this meager 34% is even unusual for Latin American standards. Uh, the closest countries are Brazil, 52%, Bolivia, 57%, and Mexico, 64%. These figures belong to American uh, surveys done by Pew Center. The dislike of, of the Argentines is only surpassed by Italy, Canada, UK, Egypt, Pakistan, and Jordan. So you might say that this Argentine attitude towards the United States 
is related to war. Not exactly. L let me uh, go very briefly through uh, Argentine-American uh, relations uh, history. Uh, Argentina and uh, the United States were born practically at the same time. And uh, they were both big promises by then. Uh, and uh, the Argentines tended to see themselves as equals, as competitors to the United States for many years. Uh, within this context, Argentina remained neutral in both wars. Uh, then the United States opposed Peronism. You might know it's, it's one of the biggest uh, political movements in, in Argentine history. And Peronism itself uh, built its ideology in anti-imperialism and won power opposing political allies of the United States in 1945. Uh, then the United States uh, supported most of the coups in Argentina and elsewhere in Latin America. In Argentina, most notably, the cruelest one in 1976, the, the one that brought desaparecidos uh, around 10 to 30,000 desaparecidos. At that time, Henry Kissinger was very active in the region. Beginning, beginning of the 70s. Uh, then uh, came the war with Great Britain on those uh, remote islands in, in the South Atlantic. At that time, the United States provided England, uh, um, Great Britain, with uh, satellite intelligence that might have caused uh, Argentine casualties. Then the colorful Carlos Menem appeared. You, you might have heard about him. He was the, the, the child of globalization, a devoted friend of uh, George Bush, father. And his foreign minister uh, used the expression carnal relations to describe the policy that his government uh, wanted to have with the United States. So given the uh, relative power and uh, the nature of the characters at play, you might very well imagine what was the role assigned to Argentina in those carnal relations. So carnal relations brought uh, Argentine participation in the Gulf War, the first one. Argentine troops went there not to fight. Uh, this participation produced 200 deaths in Buenos Aires uh, mm, two Jewish institutions were bombed uh, in the period in the lapse of, of two years with uh, with carnal relations Argentina dived with with ice shot into globalization uh, and and gave itself mainly to American uh, banks to, to, to put it very briefly and schematically. Uh, neoliberal recipe combined with Argentine inefficiency, uncritical attitude, and corruption produced a real disaster. You might know about that. Argentina defaulted on its uh, debt. 57% um, of the population went into poverty uh, compared to less than 20% before the crisis. And then there was wide unemployment. Yeah, one minute. Okay. Uh, let me talk now in this one minute about the future. Out of this uh, serious crisis, a lot of new war forms of, of doing politics are coming out. You know, forms that are... Uh, coming out of people trying to find ways to participate and to uh, look for themselves. So uh, these uh, organizations are mostly non-governmental organizations. Uh, they tend to see themselves as political tools of this new era. Whether they are going to leave a, a, a deep mark they're going to progress or not in, in Argentine politics, that, that's something you 
you cannot know now, but for certain, they will not go unnoticed. Uh, given this situation, uh, I might consider that this uh, attitude, so this, this, uh, regarding the, this way of regarding the United States is present in a very crucial moment when Argentina is trying to redefine itself. Um, let me say just one more thing, just to close here. Maybe the United States is trying to redefine itself too, going to a more equitable and fair system. Uh, if that's the case, that would be better for everybody. Um, but maybe too, the United States doesn't change in the near future and war comes to Latin America. In fact, in the last military exercise, international exercise, performed in, Buenos, in Argentina and up north, uh, had this hypothesis of a conflict between civil organizations, non-governmental organizations, and these armies, armies of South America. So this definition is very um, wearing, uh, instrumentally vague, and absolutely official. So this is, if this is the outcome, then the image of the United States, not only in Argentina, but I guess elsewhere, will, get, uh, will go deeper. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Um, <clears throat> next, we'll hear from uh, Mariko Horikawa, a correspondent for Yomiuri in Japan. Good evening. Um, I think I'd rather speak from my experience for the International News Department, which I belong for um, like eight years, um, looking at the United States from uh, a journalist's perspective, not from how to report it, but how you would uh, spend your days as a journalist in the United States. Um, becoming a, a correspondent in the United States is the easiest and the hardest job for an international uh, news department reporter in Japan because if you are stationed in the United States, that would promise you a front page story consecutively almost every day. Whereas I was stationed in Sydney in Australia, which meant that um, I had to be running for my stories to have my stories printed. Um, whereas in Washington Bureau, you could be sitting in the Bureau waiting for any press releases coming through. And the United States was reported as if it was part of Japan. Um, it's not that the Japanese perceived the United States as part of Japan, but as if the United States was its own country. Now, that's been going on for years and years and years until very recently. I remember, um, maybe it's still going on, since I wasn't in Japan for this year, I wasn't really sure, but the State of Union speech done by the president is a front page story in a Japanese newspaper. Now, the Japanese newspapers, including my newspaper, the Yomiri Shimbun, is, is a national newspaper with a readership of um, 10 million people, and the next newspaper would have a readership of 8 million people. Um, we would be reporting it in the same way, and we would be reading the President's, Mr. Bush's speech, as if it was our Prime Minister, which meant that we did know a lot about the United States. Um, the reason for it is because we would have to behave in line with whatever the United States was doing in international relations. Um, the reporters would probably be running around um, within the White House press arena looking for the papers as if it was our Prime Minister's um, State of Union speech as well as the federal budget. And besides that, reporting on the United States would be like looking at the mirror image of Japan. And this wouldn't mean that um, the Japanese perceived the Americans as being somebody like themselves, but they always wanted to reflect themselves um, by the image of the Americans. Are we ahead of them? Are we behind them? In what way? And how could we learn? Um, it would be social issues, basically. And while a lot of people in 
in the world would believe that Japan was a very undemocratic society um, before the Second World War, which isn't really the truth. Um, but we still learned a lot from how we would um, restructure our society after the Second World War. And in that way, um, a lot of the reporters would um, relate themselves to um, the social issues that would be like um, racial issues. Even though there wouldn't be any racial issues in Japan, it would be related to like the gender issues, or it could be like the indigenous people within Japan. When I came to J school, um, the first thing Orville was asking me was why Japan isn't reported anymore in the American media. And that rang a bell. And that is, the fact that Japan wasn't reported wasn't that, well, I wouldn't say it's not worrying. But I thought if there isn't any news, there wouldn't be any more reporting. And that was like, the Americans might not be interested in Japan anymore, but what's happening in Japan is it's still the front page story. As a matter of fact, while the interest among the Americans towards the Japanese is decreasing, the interest among the Japanese towards the Americans are decreasing as well. And that is probably because from the Japanese perspective, the American society is getting, has gotten really close to themselves. It's, I think they feel it as part of their society. But at the same time, I have to um, tell the people here that um, it's not that the Japanese are always um, thinking America as a favorable uh, country. Um, there's, there's been times where there were economic clashes that the Japanese felt that the Americans were really very pushy. And then recently, um, I think the Japanese are perceiving the Americans as being not able to control what they used to control. I think they're looking at the weakness of this country. At the same time, the Japanese are trying to redefine themselves. The fact that they've been covering the President's State of Union speech on their first page story, if you think it for yourselves, could you, could you imagine yourselves having another country's president's speech reported in the newspaper? I mean, as if it was your own country. The Japanese are redefining themselves as Japanese and not like half Americans. And this is um, where journalism comes in. Um, when we are reporting about the states, I, I understand that, well, I, I've noticed while I'm looking at my website every day, that the numbers of America being reported has really declined. And now it's become only the political issues. And that would be more or less scandalistic issues than like precise reports of what's been um, talked in Congress. That was the reporting that I used to see earlier. Mm-hmm. There's one thing I wanted to emphasize before I close this. Um, I had this privilege to see the Fog of War uh, um, film the other day when I, when I arrived. And I saw a lot of the audiences being shocked by the fact that um, um, the, the people in, in the, the decision-making class knew that there wasn't any necessity in bombing Hiroshima. Um, the fact is that the Japanese know have known this fact for years and years. They have also known the fact that the Americans don't know. Um, there are many things that the Japanese know, whereas the American people aren't aware of. And that's because of this big imbalance of information. But that has been very helpful to the Japanese audience as well in re re redefining their own country. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Muzamil Jamil from the Indian Express, uh, the Kashmir Bureau Chief. Good evening. I'm from Kashmir, and you know, Kashmir is part of India. Um, but here, I would, um, I don't want to speak as you know somebody from India because you know the issues are different. I want to speak um, as a Kashmiri Muslim because you know the the reaction of a Muslim to 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 United States is is what is what is more important today than being an Indian. 
something, you know, when I was leaving Kashmir to come for uh, a, a visiting scholar here, one of the things which everybody advised me was not to speak when I come here. Because, you know, you'll be, you'll be dubbed as a terrorist because, you know, your n name is Muzammil, which sounds Arabic, which is Arabic. And the first thing you will, you know, uh, you know you'll be deported within, you know, 24 hours. And uh, this is something which is completely, you know, different because, you know, I was coming to Berkeley, which is known for its free speech, and, you know, to a country which is, you know, known for democratic values. So, you know, at some level it was also confusing. But on the other level, I also understood, you know, why this is happening. You know, I was going to the United States after September 11, and September 11 had changed everything. And, you know, I, I must tell you, you know, to be frank, there's not a single person in my society which is 100% Muslim who is not anti-America, who does not hate America. The hatred of America is so much that, you know, you won't even, you won't even believe. But what is the reason? And at the same time, if you put a stall in, 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 in Kashmir or anywhere in the Muslim society and tell people, tell, you, uh, tell the youth of Kashmir to, you know, whether they want to come to America, everybody will want to come. So it's a, it's, it's a story of love and hate. You would love to come to Kashmir, you would love to come to, Kashmir, you know, to, to, to the United States, to study in the United States, to work in the United States, to live in the United States, but at the same time, you hate United States. So, you know, this is contradictory. But what is the reason? You know, why people think in this way? What I think is, you know, uh, Muslim society, you know, Muslims, you know, because the, the, the way Kashmiri Muslims think is a pattern. It's across the Muslim world. The Muslim street, youth are anti-America. And the, uh, and, and somehow there's a, you know, when I talk to people here, I've been to South, I've been to Carolina, you know, North Carolina, I've been to, you know, Washington, because I don't think Berkeley is United States. <laughs> it's a bubble. <laughs> so, you know, I've been to the real United States, and, you know, I've been talking to people, you know, why, you know, uh, you know what do they think, why people in the Muslim world hate them. And I think there is a, there is a contrast between the definitions. You know, the, the way people in, in Muslim societies think why they hate America and the way the, the, the people in the United States think why they hate us. You know, here the, the, the notion is that they hate democracy, they hate the way we live, they hate American values. But, you know, uh, I, I give you an example that people would love to come to America. You know, if they would, you know, you know, there are you know, more people in Kashmir who, who follow fashion, American fashion, than even in America, who wear jeans, who, who you know, we have MNCs there, we have, you know, multinational corporations, we have everything, we have MTV, everything is there. But at the same time, there's hatred for America. And there is also a, you know, craving for democracy as well. You know, I don't think there's any Muslim society who, you know, where people don't crave for democracy. So, you know, there is this contrast between definitions, the contrast between the define the hatred for America within America and in the Muslim societies. And uh, why I'm saying this, you know, we look at America through its foreign policy. We look at America not the way America, you know, behaves within America. We look at America the way America behaves in the Muslim world. And Especially, you know, the, one of the major reasons for this hatred is Israel-Palestine conflict. America is being seen, you know, is seen as completely unfair, you know, while dealing with Israel and, um, you know, Israel-Palestine conflict. If there is one single, you know, uh, credible um, initiative which is, which is launched in uh, Middle East to resolve Palestine, Israel conflict, you will see the, there will be a massive change in the anti-American sentiment in the Muslim world. And the other thing which, is, which, I, which I found here is that the anti-Americanism in the Muslim world, in all Muslim societies, is somehow regarded as a pro-Usama bin Laden you know, attitude. 
anybody who is anti-America and is Muslim is automatically a supporter of Osama bin Laden. Let me give you some example from Kashmir. Kashmir has been in turmoil for the last 14, 15 years. We have a huge, you know, violence every day, 20 people dying every day. In Palestine last year, there were 20, you know, suicide bombings. And in Kashmir, there were 108. It's a different reason, you know, why Kashmir is not being reported in U.S. media. That's a completely different thing. And we believe because we don't have oil wells, <laughs> and we don't live in, you know, Middle East. That's one of the reasons. But, you know, uh, looking at that, I think that, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the whole Muslim world at this point of time is completely, completely, you know, determines the U.S. intentions towards Muslims through the prism of Palestine. There is not a single other, you know, issue which determines how Muslims will, you know, react to, you know, the United States. And I'll give you one, one, one important example. Now, for example, there are two, uh, two uh, big groups in Kashmir, Lashkar Taiba and uh, Jaish e Mohammed, who are, who are very close ideologically to Osama bin Laden. But, you know, there is support for them. Why is, why is support for them in Kashmir? Because they are, you know, they are, you know, they are my enemy's enemy. They're fighting Indians. The moment they try to impose their social and political agendas on Kashmiri people, there's a reaction. So if you think they're against, you know, the, the people, the common people are against the values, are against democracy, you know, there is a problem with that. Because the moment Lashkar Taiba tries to impose burqa, veil, on Kashmiri women who are Muslim, and, and they are, most of them are devout Muslim, there is a reaction because it's against culture. Islam is not homogeneous. Islam is different in Indonesia. Islam is different in Kashmir. Islam is different in Iraq. Islam is different. And Islam is not Arab as well because there is just 20% of Muslims who live in Arab, Arab world. So what I think is that, you know, there is a difference between the definitions of the hatred for America in the Muslim world and within America. Unless there is some sort of a, you know, you, you try to understand what is the actual definition of this hatred, why people hate us. And I think the reason is the foreign policy. I think that Palestine is the main reason. If there's one credible, you know, initiative in Palestine where United States is not seen as partisan, there will be a huge, it will make a huge difference. And the other thing which I wanted to, you know, stress upon is post-September 11th. War on terror. Uh, after war on terror, every state in the world which had some sort of a problem with any Muslim populations, for example, Russia had a pro uh, problem in Chechnya, China has problem with Uyghurs, India has problem in Kashmir. Everybody tries to define war or terror in their own way. And as the unipolar, you know, unipolar power in this world, United States, completely is silent on that issue. It let every state to define the war or terror the way they wanted to define. So what has happened, Muslims, wherever, if they have a political issue, if they have a political struggle, which has nothing to do with Islam, which has nothing to do with you know, fundamentalism, they can be easily dubbed as Islamic fundamentalists. So I will I'll conclude here and you know, let's have a discussion about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Now we'll hear from uh, Lily Sadegi from Iran. Good evening. As you know, your country and my country does not have any official relation. But, uh, and I'm sure whenever you turn on your television and you have seen something uh, about Iran, you have seen that the Iranian people are saying this to America. But I should say that um, Iranian people they have never hated American as people, but just like some other people around the world, they don't, they dislike the American policy. Let me tell you a brief uh, history of mis, uh, of distrust uh, between these two countries. In 1953, 
CIA coup, uh, helped overthrow a short-lived elected uh, uh, government of Dr. Mossadegh, and uh, returning of Shah to power. This action actually snuffed out uh, budding democracy in Iran with negative uh, long-term consequences for the United States and ultimately led to uh, 1979 revolution in Iran. After, uh, after revolutionary took uh, uh, power from uh, the Shah's regime, the United States let the exiled Shah to come to to United States for medical uh, treatment. And uh, this action caused that some uh, Iranian uh, angry students think that again, United States wants to return Shah after a while, exactly as in 1953. And that was why they seized the American embassy with 52 American diplomats for uh, hostage for 444 days. And, uh, but uh, since 1979, Iranian attitudes shifted towards the U.S., both related on uh, events in Iran and also in the United States for some reasons, which, uh, as I can mention some of them, the maturing of a revolution and uh, disillusionment of uh, Iranian people with uh, revolution cause such as freedom, prosperity, and uh, such things. And also the emergence of uh, a new young generation that is redefining so, uh, social, uh, social, uh, society's goals. The generation and uh, the population in Iran is very young. 70% of our uh, population, they are under 30% and they have access to uh, internet, satellites, television, uh, to outside uh, worlds, and they can compare their country with other countries, with Western country, that how fast the other countries are uh, going and they are progressing and what their country is standing. And also the moral outrage of the way that Islam was used to justify terrorist, talk, uh, terrorist attacks. And as a result, Iranian sent a very powerful message to the, criti uh, to the uh, conservative crit uh, critical establishment of uh, Iran uh, for um, and wanted faster social and political changes, and that was why they uh, overwhelmingly uh, elected the reformist minded Mr. Uh, Khatami. And that is one of the signs of a, a revolution which has been uh, matured. Of course, in contrast, some changes also happened in the United States. For instance, uh, the former uh, state, uh, former uh, Secretary of State of uh, United States, uh, Mrs. Albright, uh, she acknowledged uh, the intervention of uh, uh, U.S. in Iranian affairs, and more or less she uh, apologized uh, Iranian people. But any time Iranian people or Iranian government began to take a positive step toward a dialogue for a better uh, relationship with the United States, U.S. made an obstacle. 
such as embargo, not freezing, not releasing the frozen uh, assets of Iranians, which uh, we, were, uh, we, we were and still we are in a very bad situation from economy point of view, and we think that this money belongs to us and why they should not be released. And, uh, and such a things. I remember a um, very vivid uh, image in my mind of, uh, and again, uh, you know, the Iranians, they thought, they think that why, why they should continue to have a relation with America when uh, they do not see any uh, positive uh, action or reaction. I remember after September 11, the uh, very young Iranian people, they went to a very famous square in Tehran for, uh, and turned out to a light, a candlelight vigil. Of course, it was very dangerous for them because the hardliner, they announced or they sent this message to the people that they shouldn't do because it shows that they have a feeling pro-American, which they don't like it. But the, um, but the Iranians, they did it. But shortly after that, Mr. Bush, in his uh, State of uh, Union, he addressed Iran as one of the three countries of access of evil. And immediately, the conservatives and the hardliners, they got this position that the reformers, they are uh, pro-American, and this is what you are looking for. The Americans, they, they don't have any respect for you. And actually, Mr. Bush, he said, this, uh, uh, this, uh, I should read it, this, uh, These people have a history of violence. Uh, it means that, you know, immediately he, he, he bothered, he insulted the Iranian nationality and Iranian religious feelings. Uh, another example uh, is um, related to Iraq occupation. The Iranians, they didn't like the America to occupy uh, Iraq, although you cannot find any nation in the world that hates Saddam's regime because of eight years war with Iran and remaining of, uh, you know, uh, and with killing of 300,000 to 500,000 very young Iranian people and uh, the same number of disabled which they are also a problem for their family and also for, their, uh, for the country. But still, Iranian didn't like that because they were afraid if U.S. occupy uh, Iraq, next door is Iran. And it is very possible that they, they want also to occupy Iran, which most of the Iranians, they don't like it. Of course, you could find a very minority of uh, angry Iranian a youngster that they would say, we wish America to occupy Iran and then we can have changes. But after, uh, after Iraq post-war, uh, even this minority, they changed their mind because they saw that Americans, they didn't bring prosperity, freedom, and still not democracy for, Amer uh, for Iraqi people. And uh, Unfortunately, unfortunately, I should say that right now in Iran, this, uh, the sense of uh, being anti-American has rise. And uh, people think that Americans or America is an oppressive country which think or, and wants only freedom and prosperity for their own people and not for other countries. And uh, I think um, America, um, 
I don't want to say should, but might uh, change its tone towards other nations, and uh, should know that uh, should know that it is not correct to say that we always know the best, and we always have the best solution for others. United States should respect others, should be sensitive and, and have respect for others' culture and uh, uh, tradition. Uh, United States cannot, uh, in one hand, uh, propagate democracy in some uh, Middle, East, uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, and in another hand, just shake hand with the dictators in the region and in Central Asia. And uh, just, just one, one thing. Uh, and I want to ask the United States government to ease uh, giving uh, a visa to Iranian students, because I know many Iranian students that cannot return to their country, although they are very homesick, because they know if they leave their country, they cannot return to uh, United States and finish their uh, study. And having relation, and these students, I am sure, when they return to their country, they are going to have sympathy with American people, because according to my uh, experience, which I have lived three years in, uh, in Germany, when you live in, in a place, you have always sympathy with, this, with those people, and you cannot stand against them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, finally, we hear from Francis Pisani, uh, uh, representing France, but also Spain and Mexico. Yes, the, the, that's the reason for which I'm going to talk for 15 minutes. <laughs> but actually, I couldn't speak only for France, and when they asked me what I am, I used to say French, etc. And uh, I am very happy to have a European passport and to have a Mexican family. So, uh, I would like to talk about Europe and Mexico and uh, try to make a distinction between what I would call perceptions and what I would call trends. The perceptions are quite obvious and they have been mentioned all along. People tend not to like the Bush administration. People tend not to like the war in Iraq with varying degrees of, 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 of conviction and of hate, uh, but people uh, remain fascinated by the US and, and keep some strong degree of admiration. Now, what are the trends in Europe? I think that the main issue, and I was there with students from this school uh, three weeks ago, uh, the, the main things is not a matter of opinion. The main thing is that the distance is growing between uh, Europe and the US. I can take the, uh, give a, few, a small flash about France. France is known for having fought for its independence since after the, or at least, at le, after the Second World War. Now there is a shift which is to insist of the independence for Europe, but the, the sentiment remains the same. And about Spain, I think that what characterized Spain in the, um, after Franco was to try to be, or since it, it, it was integrated into Europe, was to try to be a bridge between Latin America and Europe. And then with us now, we have seen a Spain which has tried to be a bridge between the US and uh, what, is, what some people call New Europe. And now it might be going, going back to uh, integrating Europe and playing a, a role of bridge maybe with the whole continent. Uh, what is happening uh, through this is there is a, a, a growing sentiment that Europe has to get its act together and uh, <clears throat> that it should be, there should be a certain degree of independence with a reasonable dosis of Atlantism. And I think the key element that helps you or helps us understand this is the growing uh, discussions that are happening between Berlin, London, and Paris. And the US wanted the enlargement of Europe from 
some because it will weaken uh, Europe. And I think that w what might happen is a Europe à la carte in which you have some countries getting closer together faster and some taking time to, uh, to get into the integrated state. Mexico is a completely different story. Uh, the, first, the relationship between Mexico and the U.S. is what we call an intermestic issue. It is, it is, meaning it is both international and domestic. And uh, the informal aspect of this integration work and the formal aspect do not work. The last figures from the census is that there are 24 million residents of Mexican origin in the U.S., 9% of official American residents, and 10 million people born in Mexico, and I'm sticking with the official figures, not including the non-official figures, and uh, what is happening is on one hand you have $40 billion which have been sent to Mexico last year by Mexicans or people of Mexican origin, but there is no law about uh, uh, making more lawful the entrance into the United States that would happen anytime soon. So the informal works, the formal does not work. What is the change in perspective from Mexico? We are, this is the title of our talk. First, people keep coming and they will keep coming but they don't believe anymore in the American dream. This is a generalization. Of course, some do. But the number of people who believe in the American dream is, is, is smaller. And I have seen some, some hints of a new expression, which is the American dream, which is like the appropriation of the dream and of the perspective that you can get when you come to the United States. There is a growing, is the second point, a growing worry about a racist backlash, and I think that Huntington piece of the challenge of Mexicans is a very serious threat in terms of being a, a, an intellectual background for reactions against Mexicans. But people here are getting organized and, I, and are voting more and more. So in summary, we have a distanciation for Europe and an integration for Mexico. What is important, I think, is that the position are less a matter of ideology than ten years ago, five years ago. Now, this invites us to ask what is the media doing, what are, the, what are we journalists doing? Uh, I will not talk about how the U.S. reports on, on the rest of the world. It has been done very clearly. But I think that first there is an issue about uh, uh, European, Mexican journalists, less so for the Mexicans, but foreign journalists here, they tend to be in Washington, at times in New York, and they ignore the rest of the country. They may speak English very well. They don't go to Wisconsin or to the real uh, United States where you have been. It is a tendency, of course. Uh, and it gives a, uh, so there is a strong coverage, but it is uniform, and it's more about Washington than anything else. Uh, the elections are not covered yet. If you look at the newspapers, they will be at some point. They promise a, a, a great coverage. And there is a provocative thing. Le Monde has done at his web, on its website a new, uh, the words of America. It's like a dictionary to understand the United States. Fine. And the word, some of the words are Cheney, Castro, Amendment, MIT, Fox News, Dow Jones, Berkeley. They are under 100 words that allow you to understand the United States. We don't go too far. <laughs> so now the, 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 the issue is uh, go back to the perception. And I think there is, my take would be that there is a double, there is a paradox. People like the image of America and they don't like the reality of America. But the, the most important thing they have an important myth in their head, in their heart sometimes, but they don't know well. It's absolutely impressive when you go to Paris, to Spain, to Madrid, or to Mexico. Mexico is, is a slightly different. The num you talk to people who are active in the government, who are active in business. Their knowledge of the United States is not what it should be compared to the importance that the United States have in their life, in their mind, and um, in, their, in their thinking. And so um, the problem is that maybe journalists are less important than Hollywood. And so Hollywood is feeding the myth. We are trying to say something, but the myth is more important than what we are trying to say. The second thing is that uh, the U.S. are key for all of us. We are stakeholders, but we cannot say and do anything. 
So we have two frustrations which are at the key of many sentiments. First, there is a myth and the reality does not look like the myth. And second, the US are key for our lives and we cannot do anything about it. So if my proposition is to change Hollywood and to give us the right of vote, I'm not sure we are going to go very far soon, but uh, the notion of frustration remains an important point. Thank you, Thank you Francis. Well, I, I want to get you out of here shortly after 8, I promise. But let's move right into some questions. Um, Michael, yes, please join us. Um, Germany won't move here. Uh, let me pose a quick one, and I want really quick answers from any of you who feel moved to do this. The relationship between America and much of the world is clearly uh, in a very fragile state, if not broken. What's the one thing you all would recommend that the United States do to begin to fix the relationship. And I, I'm talking sound bites here. Uh, let's start at this end of the table. Or, or anybody speak uh, if you have an idea. I don't want to put anyone on the spot here. Find an I think if, if the United States has to, you know, you know, uh, lower the anti-Americanism in, in, in the Muslim world, there is a need to actually work on the two-state you know, formula in the Middle East. Palestine remains the main issue. And the moment Palestine-Israel conflict is solved, you'll see a complete, you know, I, I can't dream what will happen. It will be a different world. I strongly disagree I have, a, I have a cousin who is uh, not a cousin, a, a brother-in-law who is Egyptian, and um, whenever he he's, uh, has a German passport, whenever he hears your argument, uh, which is prevalent in the whole Muslim world, he likes to say, well, there is indeed 1.5 million people living in the Gaza Strip. Uh, half of them are indeed very poor, but we have 3.5 million even more poorer Egyptians living behind the main station in Cairo. And why don't you Muslims, and he, he's a Muslim himself, talk about that? So I, I am getting a little tired of uh, having the Israeli conflict, which is pretty old, as an excuse for uh, a much larger issues that the Muslim world has with itself. For instance, the fact that there's not a single democratic nation. Uh, if you take Indonesia, which is dubious, uh, as an exception in the Arab, certainly not in the Muslim world. This is one thing. And the other thing is, would you, but your question was different, You're, and I'll answer it. What should the United States do? I think the very first thing a new president should do, uh, he should he should uh, look at the national security uh, document of uh, the, I think, November 2001, where uh, the United States um, has made it an official do doctrine to be uh, to lead legitimately lead preemptive wars. Uh, that's always been a strategic option, but to put it into writing is a huge diplomatic mistake if you connect it with the fact that the president also has repeatedly said that the United States will not allow any other nation, which obviously must include, for instance, all the European democratic nations, to surpass it in its technological ability to lead just these kind of preventive wars. That's the recipe for a political disaster, and you don't have to go back to Athens and Sparta to understand that. Uh, let, let me, as the only American on the panel, uh, <laughs> have a point of order here. I, I would just like to note that it is precisely because the Muslim world has no democracies that my president has invaded Iraq to make it into a democracy. Can yes. I react as well? Uh, I react as yes, well. I want all reactions I want to, to be brief, I, I want but to please. You know, uh, the, the, the most interesting thing is that, you know, the, the United States says that they are fighting against Wahhabi militancy. And the fact remains the source of Wahhabi, Wahhabism is Saudi Arabia, That's who right. is the biggest ally. Yeah. You, know, you know, if you think that the poverty is the main problem in the, you know, in, the, in the Muslim world, I don't agree. Because, you know, symbols matter. When Apache, U.S. made Apache helicopter, you know, 
you know, a missile is, you know, or, or, or a machine gun is, you know, uh, used from that Apache helicopter and, uh, and a teenager is killed in, in Gaza, that's how the Muslim world views the United States. You know, okay, that's your, that's your sound bite. Total disagreement with Michael. <laughs> okay, now before we have a total, I will mark your disagreement. But anybody here have a recommendation? Uh, I, it's a recommendation. All right, please. <laughs> So uh, I hope there is a new president in January. I don't think it will change much. And the issue is, if you look at what Kerry has said in the last two weeks, it is backing what uh, Bush is doing. My suggestion would be first abide by the law. There is an international law, and the United States is not abiding by the law, and it, is very, it would be very important and a very good first and easy step that the next president could do. And then the second, maybe as journalists, it, we, we would be interested in having a more complex, more in-depth coverage of the, of the rest of the world, not focusing only in what the rest of the world thinks of the U.S., but in what is happening and why it is heterogeneous and different and does not plan to change. Any other comments on this question before we open well, it up? Well, I think that the United States should have more respect for uh, United Nations resolutions. Good. All right. Uh, questions from you? There's one in the back here. Uh, yes? I just like to make a comment. I think the panel is mistaken. There have been several consistent comments that the United States made a war in Iraq to bring democracy to the Middle East. We are all forgetting that the United States made war in Iraq because we were, quote, threatened by nuclear threat, biological threat, and chemical threats. And making democracy in the Middle East was three or four ranks from that and evolved to the top when the others disappeared. Uh, I'm not going to uh, rise to the occasion to defend my earlier statement, but we'll let the record show, yes. Uh, if this panel was four years ago, what would be different? Four years ago. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have the problem. <laughs> we don't, we wouldn't have the problem pre-Bush, obviously. Uh, but no, we would simply talk about the influence of Hollywood on the culture of the Western world, you know, have a conflict, of, and it would be tremendous. And I, for one, when I was culture minister, supported the free flow of American movies into the United into the, uh, Europe. The French were totally against it. They considered me a catastrophe. So in other words, uh, those would be the must, much char more charming problems we would have. Now... <laughs> Now we have a serious problem, and the, the serious problem is what is going to happen in the Middle East? And will it spill over into Iran? As I mean, if you look at the decision-making regarding Iraq in this book by Woodward, Iran is a natural next because they don't yet have a nuclear bomb, unlike Korea. And so we are talking about very serious things here. Four years ago, it was Jose Bové. This year, it's Iraq. Elizabeth. Um, Michael, you said something very provocative that I had no, that other journalists here had not heard. Uh, you said that right after 9-11, according to your sources, there was talk of using tactical nuclear weapons in Baghdad and Kabul. Could you elaborate on that? You won't hear that question. No, I've seen it. Raising the question of whether there was discussion to use tactical nuclear weapons uh, prior to the invasion of Iraq. According to our profession as journalists, I can say, all I can say is just that I got this from very high sources whom I trust in the German government. And what exactly, and what exactly does it mean? It, it, it meant that there was talk in Washington, according to uh, my sources, uh, in the panicky moments of post-9-11 to use tactical nuclear weapons if needed. I remember, uh, not precisely and without having a source, but reading the newspaper, that the, the issue of the, to have the right or to be, to, 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 take, to be able to take the decision to use nuclear weapon was raised at some point. And I remember that it was the time where the Nautilus Institute, which is in Berkeley, published a, a report 
by people who studied the eventuality of using tactical nuclear weapon, weapons in Vietnam. So that happened, I think, in early 2002. I had no information that it was actually considered using them in Kabul and, and, and Iraq, but the, 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 the possibility of doing so was public. Another question. Uh, yes, right here. Of a change of American policy under uh, facing all this pressure that is coming up now, or is this is put, is put on the American government with all the revelations and the book publications that are happening now? Is there anything that you, where you could see there is a change of course or uh, a, you know, a better understanding or, or coming closer together? You know, I would have to say I was in Washington yesterday and I heard President Bush speak at the, this uh, uh, event I was at, and I would say there was not one single scintilla of evidence that anything much will change, except that we now need the UN. Anyone, other comments? Another question. Um, Mr. Jalil, you, you've talked about uh, the disproportionate reporting of, uh, let's say, suicide bombings in Palestine versus uh, Kashmir, and uh, this issue of what is reported and how it relates to public opinion abroad of America, for example. Um, this comes up very often, and for us it's of course something also that we're always aware of uh, when an issue fades from the press, uh, although we know something is still going on. How do any of you view your opportunities in journalism to report on, let's say, dissent within the United States or variety within the United States, a potential for influencing from your side uh, a, a more varied vision of, of this part of the conflict or the misunderstandings or however we want to describe it. Yeah, I must admit that, you know, uh, talk of Indian newspapers, because I work for an Indian newspaper, um, United States is not covered. And it's covered when it comes to, to, to actually outsourcing. You know, <laughs> that's the one thing which, which India is interested in. And mm -hmm. in the Muslim world, when it is covered, it's covered in, in context with Israel. You know, for example, the, 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 uh, whatever happened in Gaza will come to, you know, will be the front page in all newspapers which are, you know, which are owned by Muslims. But also the suicide you know, the, bombings yeah, suicide in, bomb Jeru in Jerusalem also? No, no, no. The, the, the issue is there is a bias. There is definitely a bias. I will not be, you know, mm. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling the frank opinion. No, mm. there, is a, there is a clear bias. You know, the, the, the problem is that we have somehow compartmentalized, when, you, when I come to your thing, we have compartmentalized the suffering. The suffering of, you know, Israel and the suffering of Gaza when it comes to uh, you know, a, a newspaper owned by Muslims or in a, you know, with an audience of Muslims, it's only Gaza which matters. That's the truth. But, you know, c coming back to your question, uh, United States and this diversity, it was new thing to me as well when I came to this place. And, you know, it's not being reported. And uh, people, people, people definitely, definitely, there is, there is a little difference between American people and American government. When it is, when it comes to people, you know, people in my part of the world, so you know, I think yes, there is a huge difference. The way you know, the, the government thinks and the people think is completely different, but it's not, you know, it, it doesn't reach to people. Roberto, you had a comment? No. no? Uh, right here. sympathetically about what you describe as the overwhelming perception of the rest of the world towards this country. I'm going to ask if any of you feel capable of uh, articulating in any kind of a sympathetic or uh, understanding way what might be the perception uh, of the political uh, crisis that confronts this country through the eyes of an American political leader. <coughs> Or are they all fools and, and misbegotted blind people? In other words, consider yourself a devil's advocate and speak as if you were in Washington looking at what our politicians and our leaders look at. 
and see if you can express the world through your eyes in something other than a uh, dismissive way. Can, can anybody do that? Why uh, do you feel that there's a dismissive way, there's a critical and also an even scared way that I look at some of the politicians and some of those people whom I know personally since I was stationed there, whether it's Ludwig or Pearl or Wolfowitz, uh, who haven't really changed much since those years. They're still there. Uh, and the only thing that I, uh, that I can, if that is what you asked for, is what drives them? If you ask me what drives them, and do I appreciate what drives them? And what drives them, I, I, uh, I, I'm absolutely convinced that there is a deep sincerity in Bush's uh, uh, saying, you know, liberty is uh, owed to everybody in the whole world. That is true. Um, the fact that he believes this and then simultaneously says, however, if some of these liberal, these countries um, may become as powerful as we do are, militarily speaking, we will not allow that. That doesn't wash, so there are discrepancies. But I think the sincerity of, uh, of uh, Bush is probably should not be doubted. And in fact, uh, it is the sincerity of a true believer, which you have to think about, uh, which may have consequences in the real world. And it does, obviously. But it's not dismissive. Actually, one should take them very seriously, and I do. Uh, and I do it con amore, not with hate. Uh, uh, and furthermore, to point out, um, to answer your question, uh, Different American views, in my paper, we've had in the last six or seven months, we've had Kagan write. We had Cole, uh, the uh, international law expert from Georgetown University, write on, on uh, um, Guantanamo. We've had uh, um, uh, only recently Richard Dworkin, uh, a large piece. So in other words, we have all the, even the contradictory voices of America actually are being shown and uh, to a readership of almost a million people in the site who are decision makers in Germany. So they know the debate in this country and they respect it. Um, to think that the same would happen in the New York Times, uh, I'm, you know, totally impossible. And that's something which I find uh, slightly problematical, is that uh, you have excellent journalism in this country but the pages really are only open on the op-ed page every now and then of the New York Times for foreign voices. 800, you know, 400 million Europeans is a lot. Of, uh, and they are extremely important for the United States as commercial uh, economic partners and security partners. And it would, it would uh, be interesting, I think, for the American public, at least in the elitist papers, to hear what these, the thinkers and strategists of Europe have to say, and not wait for them uh, to suddenly become foreign ministers of France and realize, hey, this guy is wild. Uh, so prepare for surprises. A question right here. I, I come from Canada, and uh, I've been in the United States for about 20 years. I think the reason that Canadians and Mexicans are among the people who hate the U.S. more even than Argentinians is because they see Americans up close and they realize how ignorant Americans are about people outside the borders. And I think that people outside of this region of the world have no idea just how little Americans know about anything outside of their own region, even within the U.S., but certainly outside of the U.S. And I'm curious if you could give any suggestions for how we can break through, you know, I mean, that's, that's what we do. We're journalists. We tell stories. So if you could tell it, like, how do I get a story about you know, something interesting, you know, a mountain climber in Iran or a, a um, you know, scuba adventure in Japan or something into a major paper here so people have realized there's something in the world other than just wars and, and uh, you know, train wrecks. I think you're asking the wrong people <laughs> because they'd like to get into those papers too. <laughs> but I'd like to, to, to make a small... Um, thing. Uh, when I said about, when I talked about the 34 percent of the people in Argentina, only 34 percent of people uh, with favorable opinion uh, towards the United States, I didn't mean that the rest, more than uh, around 70 percent, 
would hate the United States. Uh, I would very much repeat what many of the, the, our, our colleagues here have said about this um, ambiguous, ambivalent uh, uh, um, attitude towards the United States. I would say some, only very militant people might hate the United States and most of the people uh, admire the United States. So I don't see hate. It's more a question of image. I, I was, I was uh, referring to that. Now we have time for one more question. Who is a really good one? <laughs> All right, Mark, I'll, I'll take a chance with you. <laughs> be great. Well, I, I moved to speak by the assumption of the great cosmopolitanism of Canada. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, there you go. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Nauman uh, mentioned uh, Robert Kagan, and I'm not very sympathetic to, to his views, but I do uh, find myself thinking as I hear this discussion that there is kind of a nightmare that's been unleashed on the world over the last few years, and it is the notion that the United States, with its enormous disparity of power, might actually use its enormous disparity of power. And uh, that, that part of what we're seeing, and I, I don't agree with the Iraq war, I spoke out a lot against it. Um, but I can't help but think that some of what uh, the remarks, particularly from Europeans, are rooted in is a notion that for a half a century the United States did supply the defense of Europe, allowing European power uh, to diminish in a quite, quite dramatic way. And that uh, when George Bush, when you had a president come to office who actually uh, was a unilateralist, uh, the voices of Europeans were uh, ignored in a way that, that, that these people who believe so strongly in power and military power could afford to do because they were looking simply at Europe as second-rate powers. And that what we're seeing are two different ideas, very different ideas of what power is, and that I mean, I, as I say, I don't agree with Kagan, but I understand listening to you, his view, which is that uh, Europeans squeak and protest because that's all they can do. And if they had, if they were willing to pay the taxes and so on that Americans do to uh, have a military force that Americans have, they would have a larger voice in how the world is run. That's a cr very crude way to put it, but that essentially is his, is his argument. Uh, that we're, we're hearing sort of the voices of civilization, but the voices of civilization are high-pitched and squeaky because of weakness. Uh, that's my comment. That's not really a question. But. Yeah. I think, uh, I think you, you reported uh, or, uh, Kagan very closely, and that's exactly what he says. But to start out with the little things, his mythology isn't so, so great. Uh, Venus was the emblem of the victorious uh, legions of Caesar. They carried Venus, not Mars, on their shields. Let's, uh, let's start there. And then, you know, move up uh, um, um, a millennium or two, and we look at how, in fact, did uh, the Cold War end. Well, first of all, um, it is true that America provided the nuclear umbrella for the Cold War simultaneously uh, Germany, uh, let's not even mention France, which had its nuclear uh, short-range missiles pointed at Germany, uh, seriously, um, until it was all over, um, was able to provide two million um, soldiers because we had a draft overnight within 24 hours fully armed on the designated theater of a conventional war in Europe if it had to be fought. So it wasn't that, you know, Venus was preparing for uh, a love fest uh, with its neighbors while the United States was rattling its saber. Uh, in fact, the Cold War ended because the Poles distorted a, uh, um, a non-military and a non-aggressive way of dismantling it, and the Soviet Union slowly collapsed under its own system including, yes, because of its uh, uh, incredible armament. But if we look at today's world, the United States has a defense budget which is equal to the gross national product of 27 African nations. 
It is. It has a defense budget, I think, of $401 billion, excluding the Iraq war. Uh, um, this is yeah, George, what? This is not only George Bush. No, no, no. I, no, no, no. It's not only George Bush, but George Bush is, is, has made it clear uh, officially to use it whenever he, uh, he feels liberty is threatened, wherever that may be. And that's scary. And the real question that I have, and that journalists actually should have, is what is this enormous budget good for? Who is actually threatening the United States? Is it China? I mean, a budget of $401 billion, that's exactly, I think, five or seven times the budget of Germany, which has 80 million people, and still the draft. So we still have drafted soldiers. So in short, of, um, that, there, are, there are issues uh, that have nothing to do with Bush, but they have a lot to do with the self-understanding of the United, Nations, the United States as a, a hyperpower, a superpower that can put teeth to its foreign policy. And the Europeans indeed have now had an experience with the good help of the United States and all these treaties, all these alliances that you can actually talk your way out of a crisis. It takes much longer, and unfortunately, it, uh, the period of your conversations, your political conversations, usually do not coincide with your legislative period or actually your elected time as president, prime minister, or whatever. That's the big problem, is that negotiations, uh, peaceful negotiations, do not overlap with the careers of politicians. And there is always discontinuity and change of attitude, as we now found out with Blair, for instance. So in short, uh, the, the, the vision of Kagan as this weakling called Europe, which should stop squeaking and, um, and adhere to the new realities of Athens, um, uh, or Rome for that matter, is a metaphor which I think uh, does not really uh, wash with the realities uh, of Europe. Again, it's one of the biggest success stories, I think, in the history of mankind that the Europeans haven't fought each other since 50 years, and the Americans were extremely helpful in that. But we learned lessons, and one of the lessons was wars kill people. And let's not have that again. So it's very simple. Well, listen, I want to um, thank you all for coming and thank the Goethe Institute of San Francisco and the World Affairs Council, both of who, uh, which have co-sponsored this event, and thank you, this legion of uh, panelists.